Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending our webinar today. Uh, we still have quite a lot of attendees still getting into uh, the Zoom room, so we'll just give them another minute or so and then we'll get started. I think we'll give it a few more seconds as we can see um, some quite a lot of people are still joining the room, so we'll um, start shortly. Right. Good afternoon and welcome to this SW financial reporting webinar from wherever you are. I am Renee Muller, a partner in our insurance and advisory division, and I will be moderating today's session. It is great to have so many of you here today for our fourth and final reporting financial reporting webinar of 2021. Firstly, I acknowledge the traditional custodians throughout Australia and their connection to land, sea and community. And we pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. <clears throat> our presenters today are from across the SW national practice. We're going to start with our guest presenter, Sam Morris, a partner in our tax division, who will give us an update on the employee share scheme. Then I will go through an ASIC and other regulatory update, followed by Jimmy Chow, who will run through what's new in accounting standards. Hayley Underwood will then give us a not-for-profit update. And finally, I will give you a snapshot of some recent relevant IFRIC decisions. Hopefully there'll be some time left at the end for some Q and A's. So before we start, I would like to run through some housekeeping. We recommend that you click on the enter full screen button at the top right hand um, of um, corner of your screen to achieve the best webinar experience. If you click on the Q and A button at the bottom of your screen, a window will pop up that will allow you to send us questions as we go. We will monitor these and answer any that we can during the presentation. Some we will save for the Q&A at the end of the session, but for more bespoke questions, we may need to come back to you after the session today. So let's jump in. Sam will kick us off today with an update on employee share schemes. The reason why we asked Sam to talk on this hot topic today is twofold. Firstly, there are some proposed legislative changes coming to be mindful of. And secondly, we're seeing an almost unprecedented level of transactions in the market at the moment, and often those transactions will include employee share schemes. Sam, over to you. Thanks, Renee. So there's really been a, a resurgence in the popularity of share and incentive plans um, since the rules have progressively become more favourable again um, in recent years after seeing a decline a number of years ago. The key benefits of employee and incentive plans are really to engage with your people, um, recognize and reward them for helping essentially to build your business and commonly used as a retention strategy. Employee share schemes can be used to reward past performance as well, but most commonly geared towards the future. So most plans would align with the interests of employees um, but really with the strategic objectives of the business. So for example, if you're working towards an IPO or trade sale and rewarding key people for the part that they play in that. There are numerous different alternatives um, to consider with share and incentive plans. And the term employee share scheme really is a generalized term, um, but the plans themselves could refer to shares, to options, rights, or other mechanisms to provide benefits to employees. We'd often refer to these um, as an award. Incentive plans are, are typically where employees are offered some form of equity in the business. So this can be in the form of shares or rights to shares. So for example, a right to acquire a share at a later point in time. The business issuing the awards could be the direct or the indirect employer of the individual participants, and they can be an Australian or, or an overseas entity. We see a lot of both. 
So for example, a US holding company could be issuing stock options to Australian employees who are actually employees of the Australian subsidiary and maybe have very little connection at all with the holding company itself. And whilst this is quite common, there are some traps to be aware of, which I'll come on to later. There are special rules within the Tax Act that deal with employee share schemes, including how to value them and how to ensure that the value provided in this form is taxed consistently with other forms of remuneration, such as salary and wages. And prima facie, the, the discount to market value is taxed essentially upfront when the employee receives the award, unless the plan can qualify for tax deferral. That can be quite tricky to assess and all plans are written differently. So it's good to get advice on whether you have an existing plan or are looking to put a new plan in place to really understand what, what that means. Choosing the, the right plan and structure for your organisation and your objectives is really important. And um, there really needs to be a good balance, I think, between rewarding the employees, considering their tax outcomes and position, and ensuring that the business objectives are met. So, for example, you know, ask yourselves, what are you trying to reward them for and when? Timing of the employee tax is really key. It, I'd probably say it isn't usually much of a reward if an employee has to pay tax on something before they actually receive the value for it. So it's important to get the timing right. And it's good to think about aligning the employee reward, probably with a liquidity event or potentially a liquidity event. So in this case, you know, they would get, get value from the business at the same time as the main shareholders of the business would. It's really important to seek advice on international plans, and this comes up quite regularly um, across our practice. We often see US plans in particular, which are worded very differently to what we would expect here in Australia, and they can operate quite differently um, overseas to, to domestic rules as well. So as Renee mentioned, there are some proposed changes that are due to come through once draft legislation goes through Parliament and receives royal assent. So these changes largely relate to what we would refer to as one of the deferred taxing points, and that is the cessation of employment. So this has been a bit of a bone of con contention for a number of years, because commonly employees would retain their awards even if they've left an organisation. But for tax purposes, this triggers a taxing point and often requiring the employee to sell some or all of their awards just to pay the tax. So this is a bit of a fix to that problem. The proposals remove the cessation of employment as a taxing point, but this is only for new awards. So these are new awards that are granted once the legislation comes in. So for existing plans that you might have in your business, ceasing employment will continue to be a taxing point where those awards have already been issued prior to this legislative change. And the likely date for the new legislation to take effect is the 1st of July 2022. That's assuming that Royal Assent happens before that date. So I thought I'd touch as well on, on the startup concessions. Um, these were introduced back in 2015 and really aimed to support small and newer businesses with their engagement and retention strategies by providing some really quite specific special rules both in terms of issuing uh, of the issuing entity and the conditions of the awards themselves. So the qualifying companies that we're talking about, um, I've listed on the screen some of those provisions. So unlisted Australian resident companies, they need to have aggregated turnover of less than $50 million in the financial year prior to the grant of awards and all of the companies in the group must have been incorporated for less than 10 years. So when we talk about startups, 10 years is quite a long time. You could have a business that's been going a while and still be considered a startup for these purposes. And the plan also must um, meet some specific conditions, including they should, the awards should be held for three years or at least be intended to be held for three years or more. The exercise price of any rights needs to be at least market value of the ordinary share when granted. And the discount on shares cannot exceed 15% of the market value when provided to the employees. 
The key benefits of qualifying for the startup concessions really are that the taxing point for employees on options or shares is deferred until the actual disposal date. So when the employee sells the shares. So that's quite a significant deferral of tax. The other benefit is the CGT discount should apply, which would halve the assessable gain. And there are some concessional valuation rules. Um, the ATO have approved some valuation methodologies, um, which really um, have, have got some good advantages in terms of really trying to keep the valuation as low as possible so that the discount is lower and hence the tax becomes lower. Um, and this is really used as a key way to help businesses, um, particularly in the early stages with cash flow. Um, and can often be an alternative to, to the usual um, remuneration. Finally, I just wanted to touch on reporting. Um, this is a big trap that we regularly see, particularly with international plans. Um, employers need to meet annual reporting obligations, and this is both to the ATO and to the employees themselves, so it's similar to a, um, a payment summary. Um, and it's important to note that there can be really serious penalties for non-lodgement, particularly for significant global entities. Commonly, we see that payroll tax is frankly missed altogether sometimes. Um, it's important to note that um, any awards issued to employees are subject to payroll tax, whether those awards are issued here or overseas. And there can be some flexibility around the timing of the payroll tax obligations in certain circumstances, but always consider the payroll tax obligations. With international plans, it's, it's usually the local Australian subsidiary that's responsible for the calculation of the discount, reporting to the ATO and paying payroll tax. And formal ATO reporting and data matching came in probably about six years ago now, but we still see you know, companies, whether they be large or small, who've not been complying. There's, it still seems to be a, a little bit of a lack of awareness that there is a formal reporting regime. We have some ATO approved software solutions that we use with our clients and um, which help with reporting. And we're obviously always happy to help um, if, you, if you need some assistance. So probably just a few closing remarks for me. Um, if you have a plan in place, make sure you understand how it operates and that you're doing your reporting correctly. Usually the people that are responsible for reporting aren't the same people that have put the plan in place. So getting some guidance around what the plan rules actually mean um, can, can be useful. If you're looking to put one in place, make sure you get advice to understand what options are available and what will suit your strategic plans. And I think now more than ever, the war for talent is real. So our retention strategies will become increasingly explored um, and we'll see more and more employee share plans in different forms um, in the market. So thanks for having me along to present and I'll hand back to Renee. Thanks for that, Sam. That was uh, very informative and very interesting. And I know a lot of our clients are looking into transactions and all sorts of interesting things at the moment and employee share schemes will continue to be uh, quite a significant focus, I think, for businesses in, in this kind of climate. Next up, I'm gonna run through an ASIC and regulatory update for you. <clears throat> First of all, director identification numbers. So that's uh, the hot topic at the moment, it seems. All directors of a company, registered Australian body, registered foreign company, or Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander corporations will need a director ID. The scheme will be administered by the ATO and it was designed to stop illegal phoenixing activities as well as increase the accountability and traceability of directors. So the registrations are now open by the ABRS and you've got about a year to register existing directors so until the end of November 2022. For new directors being appointed between now and early April 22, you'll have 28 days from the appointment date to register and thereafter directors must be registered before being appointed. So as all the things regulatory, there will be significant penalties um, for failure to comply with this. We've done a, um, a bit of a detailed um, alert that's available on our website if you want more information, otherwise give us a call. 
The next area to run through is just financial reporting deadlines. I know that ASIC has been consulting with firms and financial reporting specialists and so on about the need for extending deadlines further for December 2021, but we've not yet heard any uh, media releases from ASIC on that. So at the moment, subject to hearing from them in the next few weeks, it's um, you know, back to you know, back to normal for deadlines. So just a reminder, the most recent deadline extensions apply to companies with year end from 23 June um, to 7 July 2021, who um, got a one month extension for listed and unlisted entities. And AGM deadlines were also extended um, for either by two months or four months, depending on the year end and the nature of the entity. Looking at um, ASIC's most recent financial statement review findings that they've um, issued. So these apply to the 31 December 2020 uh, financial statement reviews. So they reviewed the financials of 85 listed entities and had 22 matters that they further investigated. As you can see, there were 10 of those queries that related to impairment and valuation of assets. So this continues to be very much um, at the top of the agenda for ASIC um, impairment valuation of assets. Um, and what they have said is um, the reasonableness of cash flows and assumptions was really key to, to, um, to the financial statements and to the disclosures. And they uh, also said all the assumptions, um, some key estimates, some thinking around, you know, the impairment workings and someone needs to be disclosed properly. And also they had a focus on expected credit losses on receivables in their reviews. In terms of their ongoing focus areas for their surveillance program, they've not actually issued their 31 December uh, 2021 uh, focus areas yet. So we're still working off the 30 June ones and assuming there won't be any significant change for December. So I'll just run through what the um, June key focus areas were because it's unlikely that they will change significantly. Um, and at the top of the agenda continues to be asset values provisions going concern. And so what ASIC has said is they want uh, companies to show that they're considering economic factors, short-term, long-term, the, the impact on supply chains, customers, borrowers, and lessees in the current environment. They want companies to consider the exposure that the business has on overseas operations and currencies. And up until now, when it, when it came to looking at going concern and asset values and so on, uh, companies have might have had a lot of government assistance and other COVID-19 kind of concessions that may no longer be available. And now going forward, companies need to show that they've considered how the business will do now and how the asset values will um, you know, reflect no longer having that assistance in the, in the coming months and years. In terms of going concern, looking at the operating cash flows, debt financing and covenant compliance, as well as access to capital, continues to be key considerations that companies need to demonstrate. And then also looking at what the management plans and the response to the pandemic has been. <clears throat> in terms of impairment of non-financial assets, goodwill and other indefinite life intangible assets need to be tested annually for impairment anyway. Um, but for all, all, all uh, non-financial assets, companies need to consider whether there's any impairment indicators due to the current environment. So you might have impairment indicators that's got nothing to do with the current environment or COVID, but you need to also take all that into account when you consider uh, whether there might be impairment, impairment indicators. Uh, um, key assumptions um, in, in estimating a recoverable, uh, recoverable amount needs to be appropriate. And what we are actually seeing in practice is we are seeing uh, when companies are doing cash flow forecasts, when they're doing value and use calculations, we are seeing discount rates needing to be higher um, to reflect uncertainty in the environment and to reflect the risk in a lot of industries and a lot of businesses. And so we are seeing um, quite a hike in discount rates from what we've seen um, previously at the moment. So ASIC also wants to see companies disclosing their assumptions, estimation, uncertainty, sensitivity analysis, and any probability weighted scenarios that they've taken into account in their impairment reviews. In terms of property assets, this we're in this process of change that everyone's talking about, office, work practices, uh, physical stores versus online shopping. So whether this online shopping is just temporary as part of lockdowns, or whether this will continue, I think still remains to be seen really. We can all speculate about 
what the future of shopping and work practices will be, but it, it's still evolving as we speak and as we reported 31 December. And so there will be some assumptions around that when doing a evaluation of a property asset. And we have seen a lot of um, formal valuations being done with a high degree of valuation uncertainty in the um, valuation um, in the valuation report that companies have received. Um, and so ASIC is also saying we need to take into account the financial position of the tenants and any potential restructuring of agreements with tenants as well when valuing those property assets. In terms of expected credit losses, any assumption in there needs to be appropriate, reasonable and supportable. What we are say, seeing at the moment is that past models that might have applied year on year and might have been reasonable for the industry and the company doesn't necessarily represent the current circumstances. So even if your company and your industry hasn't necessarily been impacted significantly by COVID, for example, your customers might have been. And so, um, you know, you need to think about what do you know about your customers? What kind of financial information about them are you using about your debtors and so on? And then you might find that it might be more appropriate at the moment in this environment to use some probability weighted scenarios rather than just applying um, the same model that you've had in the past. And then, of course, disclosures around estimation uncertainties and key assumptions continues to be a key focus area for ASIC. Values of other assets. Inventories is an interesting one at the moment. We've got some, um, some industries in Australia, such as um, you know, automotive dealers or building suppliers, where you, couldn't, you can't get enough stock and the demand is much higher than the inventory you know, being available at the moment in Australia. But, and then you've got other industries where consumer goods or household goods might have sold, you know, at, at historical highs over the last couple of years. And so companies might have built up the stock levels to meet that demand. Whether that demand level will continue over the next few years remains to be seen. So there is still a lot of um, change in industries and change in consumer behaviours at the moment, and also availability of inventories and you know, supply and demand factors that need to be considered when you look at your valuation of inventories. Um, the fair tax asset, what's the probability of realising those? Uh, and then you might also find valuation uncertainty around your investments in unlisted entities. For provision, provisions, you need to consider whether you might have unrisk contracts, financial guarantees or restructures um, of your group or your business that you need to take into account for provisioning. Um, at 30 June, we still had subsequent events as a key ASIC focus area. Over the last couple of years with border closures and lockdowns and so on, and potentially being announced post year and significantly impacting entities, that was a significant area. Whether that will continue to be a significant focus for, for ASIC going forward remains to be seen, but for now, let's, let's assume it is. And then finally, ASIC is highly focused on disclosures in the financial statements at the moment. Um, both IFRS or your general disclosures in the financial statements, as well as disclosures in your operating and financial review. So for financial statements, ASIC is saying directors need to consider what information would an investor want to know. So investors don't want off the shelf standard disclosures. They want, they want to know things specific about the entity. Um, they want to understand the uncertainties, the assumptions and the sensitivities in the accounts. Um, and they want to be able to make comparisons between entities. And to, to be able to make comparisons, they need to really understand what the directors were thinking in determining the numbers and so on in the financial statements. They want to understand disclosures around probability weighted scenarios, which seems to be a recurring theme coming out of ASIC at the moment in valuing assets. Um, and also um, investors want to understand the appropriateness of classific classification of assets and liabilities as current or non-current. In terms of the IFR, um, ASIC really wants companies to tell the story of the business. What's been happening in the last 12 months? How has the business and the industry impacted? How is it evolving? You know, what are, what's the company actually seeing in practice? And for the information included to be clear, understandable and supportable. Um, and so that, those are the ASIC focus areas at the moment. Next up, I just want to run through the ASIC corporate plan really quickly. So ASIC has released a corporate plan for 2021 to 2025. And they basically identify four key focus areas. One is economic recovery. The second one is reducing risk of harm to consumers. The third area, um, cyber resilience and cyber security. And finally, driving industry readiness and compliance, including some law reforms. 
So if you're interested in reading that, that's available on the ASIC website. A couple of other things out of ASIC recently. Um, ASIC has issued a guide, a sort of a best practice guide on crypto asset related investment products. So the guide covers how market operators um, admit and supervise these products, some information on best practice for custody of crypto assets, pricing methodology, and disclosure and risk management. It seems like they have basically embraced, okay, this is here, this is here to stay. So let's now move forward on best practice in Australia of how to deal with crypto assets. JobKeeper, this applies to listed entities who receive JobKeeper from 14 September, 2021. Listed entities must disclose the number of individuals for whom JobKeeper was received, the amount of JobKeeper payments and whether or how much voluntarily repaid of their JobKeeper subsidies that they received. And so, and there's a bit of nuance around when you need to report based on when your accounts were lodged, but in a nutshell, and the deadline is looming for basically listed companies who receive JobKeeper to make those disclosures. Um, ASIC's also sent a letter to Australian CEOs of large and listed entities urging them to look at their whistleblower policies, reminding them of the legal requirement to have a whistleblower policy and sharing some example of issues, some examples of issues that they found in their reviews and some suggestions for improvements on whistleblower policy. And there's also some new guidelines applicable from 1 October um, around some reforms around breach reporting of AFSL entities. So if your entity holds an AFSL, um, I would strongly suggest you have a look at those. Right, and that's it for a regulatory update. I'm going to hand over to Jimmy Chow uh, to run through some accounting standard changes. Thanks, Renee. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk you through uh, what are some of the changes to the accounting standard. So after a few years of heavy uh, accounting standard being effective for the first time, that's uh, the new revenue standard, the financial instrument standard, and the new leasing standard, we kind of enter into a slightly quiet period. So if you can see on the list, um, um, they are going to be the accounting standard going to be effect for the first time um, for the December year end entities and uh, for next six months for the June year end entities. So that wasn't a lot of significant ones. So for the first ones on the, uh, the uh, in interest rate benchmark reform, so this is to do with the abolishment of LIBOR. Uh, if you have any loan, any uh, borrowings that's denominated in LIBOR, you may want to look into this particular standard. Uh, there's a couple of other uh, adjacent standard addressing this whole uh, issues, but I believe in Australia, there wasn't a lot of um, loans that's uh, referenced to LIBOR. And the second one is to do with that we are going to have a new insurance contract standard. So this is not the standard itself, but um, the one I listed is basically to say uh, the new insurance standard going to be uh, pushed back for another year. So our main focus in the next six to 12 months is still going to be the removal of special purpose um, financial statements. So if you have attended any of our webinar in the past six to 12 months, you probably have heard us talk about this topic. It is one of the biggest topic we have seen in the past um, 10 to 15 years in Australia accounting uh, standard world. So just a very quick um, refresher what's going to change. So from June 2022, which is the mandatory deadline for June year end entities, the option to prepare a set of special purpose financial statement is no longer available for some of the entities. So if you are a company that's required to prepare a set of accounts because of law and regulations and um, ask you to do so, that's those large um, proprietary companies and uh, if you are preparing and um, if you are holding an AFSL license or if you are subsidiaries of our foreign entities, so you will have legislative requirement to prepare a set of accounts and that set of accounts need to be general purpose financial statement. 
from June 2022. Or if there is a document ask you to prepare a set of accounts. So the, docu the document can be a trustee, a partnership agreement, or a loan agreement. So if the document asks you to prepare a set of accounts based on Australia accounting standard, so this is the brand that we want to attack, uh, we want to protect. So if you are loan agreement asks you, if you have, have a document asks you to prepare a set of accounts based on Australian accounting standard, and this also subject to grandfathering if the document is not changed. Sorry, if you have changed the document from 1st July 21. So if you haven't changed anything, you're fine, you're grandfather, but you have changed it from 1st July 21, you are required to prepare a set of general purpose financial statement. So the early adoption windows for June year end entity has already passed. But if you are a December entity, if you are still looking into transiting into um, general purpose accounts, you can still do so because gen uh, December year end entity uh, have another six months to do it. So I have include a link to our webinar. Um, we have the uh, one hour sessions on this particular particular topic, addressing some of the application issue. How do you actually move from general uh, from special purpose to general purpose? So I highly recommend if you haven't get your heads around this topic, watch our webinar. So now we have looked at what's going to be effective first time for uh, in the next six to 12 months. Let's look a little bit um, beyond. So some of this um, standard listed here is going to be effective next year and some of those will be following years. The reason we include those is because um, some of the standard require restatement of uh, the comparative. So the, uh, if it's applicable to you, you will want to think about it um, early on. So I'm going to touch on the first three uh, items in a bit more details. So um, then the ASB 17 uh, insurance contract, that was the one I just mentioned, uh, it's going to be um, first time effective for um, uh, 1st January 2023. So we, um, we, I will not um, discuss this in too much detail because it's a very uh, niche market. And I believe uh, if any of the insurance company, they may be affected by this, they are already all over it. And the next ones on the deferred tax. So the new requirements basically saying, if you have a transactions, when you are booking in the transaction, it goes debit assets and credit liability if it doesn't have any PL impact. So think make good provisions, think uh, your lease accounting. So you will debit make good asset, credit make good provision. Those didn't go into the PL. So the new requirement basically clarifies saying those transaction also need to be deferred tax effected. So there is a bit um, inconsistency um, in the market. So the uh, accounting standard has addressed that inconsistency. So now we look into uh, the annual improvement. So the annual improvement is a, it's a amendment to address some of the inconsistencies happened in um, various accounting standard. And if, and also they are not too big to become a standalone amendment by itself. But I do think um, two of this amendment um, that's worth mentioning here. So the first one is to do with property plan equipment. So what's the amendment say is, uh, if you are generating sales, when you are preparing uh, your property plan equipment to be uh, ready to use, any of the sales proceeds you generate will need to be bring into PNL. So the alternative of some of the company, the current approach is whatever sales proceed they 
generate, they go offset against uh, the cost of the fixed assets. So that's no longer going to be an option. So we, the accounting standard board believe uh, this is going to have material impact to uh, mining companies, the oil and gas companies. So in general, those extractive company because um, their preparation of the um, PPNE tend to take longer and they do usually run a test trial to, uh, to see whether any um, of the plant work as intended. So if you are affected by this accounting standard, you want to look at it now because uh, the standard require you to apply the uh, amendment uh, retrospectively, which also means you need to restate your um, comparative figures. And the next uh, standard is on um, provisions. So as Renee mentioned before, ASIC has one focus area on provisions over onerous contracts. So this accounting standard is to say when you're assessing an onerous contract, when you're assessing a loss making contract, what are some of the costs need to be considered as part of your assessment? So the cost is no longer just going to be your incremental direct cost. It also include any other costs that's um, that's attributable to the contract to fulfill the contract. So the net is going to be cast a bit wider. You will expect to see a bit more contract become loss making, become onerous, and you will want to uh, look at any of those contracts need to um, put in a provision under the new uh, requirement. So now we look into the classifications of liabilities into current and non-current. And interestingly, ASIC also pick on that. So that was one of their, uh, their focus area. So this particular amendment is to clarify what are some of the liability that need to be classified as non-current. So in general, a liability is to classify as non-current if the entity has the right to defer settlement for 12 months. So the key words here is right to defer settlement. So what has changed here, in the old standard, you used to require to have unconditional right to defer settlement for you to be able to classify the liability into non-current. But in the new accounting standard, they acknowledge the unconditional right. It's very difficult to achieve it. So they change the wording to say, if the right have substance, then you can defer, you, you can classify the liability into non-current. So it does require a bit of judgment to understand what is substance. And the right also need to be existed at the year end, which means you have to be compliant with your loan covenant. And the accounting standard, the new accounting standard does one step further to say, if you, your covenant is only required in the future. So uh, if you are doing your June set of accounts and your covenant is not tested until September, so you will have to be in compliance with your September covenant for you to be classifying the liability into non-current. So this make some of the situation a little bit more, uh, a bit trickier. So for example, if you have an increased covenant requirement, you have to estimate, am I going to be still compliance with the covenant three months down the road? So what hasn't changed? from the definition is management's expectations of whether or not you are going to pay the liability um, beyond 12 months. So the management may believe, may say, um, no, we are going to refinance this loan. We have been in talking with the financier. We're not going to pay off this loan in the next 12 months. So that doesn't really take into consideration when you're considering if uh, liability is a current or non-current liability. Uh, so our takeaway message is to see 
if you have a loan, you have been classified as a non-current liability, it is a good time to just revisit the loan, look at the facts and circumstances to see whether it's indeed um, non-current liabilities. And also if you have a loan and you have a loan agreement, they have some those tricky covenants. So it might be a good time to have the conversations with the bank to see if some of the things can be changed. And from the accounting standard perspective, they do believe this particular amendment is going to have a pretty big uh, wide impact. So that's the reason they have push out the implementation date by another year to 1st first, first January 2023. So they do try to give um, company amplified time to prepare this amendment. So my next um, topic is again on my favorite topic on disclosure. Um, as Renee mentioned before, um, the Essex also all over this area they want the company to show, um, to tell a story in their financial statement to let the investor understand what's exactly happening to the company. So in order to make this thing happen, the accounting standard board introduced this amendment. What does it do is to say, you now not required to disclose all the accounting policy or the significant accounting policy. If you look at the set of accounts, half of the financial statement is the accounting policy. And a lot of time you, you, you know those policies are coming from a set of model financial statements. So now the new requirement is to say, you only disclose material accounting policies. So what are material accounting policy that can be if you change any of your accounting policies, or if there is an option for you to take, whether you can do fair value or whether you can do cost. So if that's an option, so that tend to be a material accounting policies. And if this policies is in relation to a complex transactions or transaction involve judgment, those are tend to be material accounting policies. So the standard is going to be effective uh, in for 1st January 2023. So if you think um, you want to do some prep work thinking about it, by all means come and talk to us. So now I am going to hang over to Hayley. Uh, she will um, bring you through what are some of the changes and updates in not-for-profit space. Hayley? Great, thanks, Jimmy. Um, so the first thing I just wanted to cover was the ACNC annual report for 2021, which has just been published by the ACNC, which provides an overview of the Commission's work in the 21 financial year. And I just thought I would just touch on, um, I guess it just demonstrates again, um, how active the regulator is in the space, but also how active the public is in engaging with the ACNC. So in the 21 year, the ACNC processed 5,886 applications for charity registration. They refused 151 charity registrations and 89% of those refused was due to the applicant not providing enough information in the initial application. They did receive 2,001 concerns from charities mostly around the perceived mismanagement of funds and 13 charities had their registrations revoked. The charity register is having a growing sense of awareness to the general public, which can be really seen just by the year on year increases that are occurring in terms of the number of searches, um, which demonstrates how valuable the tool is to the general public with 4.2 million searches during the 21 year. I did touch on this in our last um, update, but I, I just thought it would be helpful for those preparing um, December accounts that there is a best practice guide that was released in December 2020 by the ACNC, which encourages medium and large charities to consider to disclose additional information about the funding they receive from government. 
in short, if 10% or more from total, of total revenue is from government, then they're asking you to disclose certain information about the total funding received and what level of government is providing that funding up to the top 10 funders. They're also asking that you disclose where you are economically dependent in your accounts on, and you receive a significant amount of your revenue from government. And they're also asking those that are not a preparing special purpose and may not be um, a, uh, uh, may not be preparing their accounts in accordance with AASB 15 and 1058 that you disclose the funding from government that you received in a point in time, which may not be recognised as revenue for accounting purposes. The widespread use of the recommended disclosures is designed to improve the consistency and comparability of the financial information on the ACNC register. And that's the reason that the best, uh, best practice requirements have been announced. So there was legislation amended in September 21, which I also did mention was looming in the last update. And that requires non-government deductible gift recipients to be registered as charities from the 14th of December this year. Whilst charity registration was an existing requirement for a majority of general DGR categories, this amendment has extended it further to the remaining DGR categories, except for ancillary funds and any of those specifically listed under tax law. So these changes, there is a transition period, the ACNC are giving you obviously an, a year of transition to get registered as a charity, noting that it isn't a simple exercise and, and lodging a form, you do need to engage with the ACNC on your charity registration. And they are also open to additional three year extensions in limited circumstances. Following on from that, so the ACNC are continuing to be active in the DGR space and obviously in the 21 annual report they did publish that they reviewed 303 DGR endorsed charities and they found the results from those reviews did identify a number of concerns ranging from straightforward matters to also potentially serious matters around their entitlement to be registered as a charity. The ACNC has encouraged charities to undertake a self-review assessment to ensure that there aren't any risk areas identified after this self-assessment. And they have a tool available on the website. You can also speak to your SW advisor if you have any concerns around your DGR status and we will be happy to assist. Treasury announced a new financial reporting reforms, which again, we have been talking about for a little while knowing that they were occurring. This has now become in force and will take effect from 1 July 2022. And basically it's increasing the thresholds of charity sizes for minimum ACNC reporting requirements, lifting the small charity threshold to less than 500,000, giving you a requirement to lodge an annual information statement. The medium charities has been lifted to between 500,000 or more, but less than 3 million. And that has a requirement to have your financial report either reviewed or audited. And larges has lifted to the 3 million threshold and you need an audited financial statement along with lodging AISs. There has also been some um, additional announcements that from 1 July 2022, large charities with two or more key management personnel will be required to report the remuneration paid to responsible persons, i.e. directors and senior executives on an aggregated basis in their annual information statement. And then from 1 July 2023, all charities will be required to adhere to this. I just thought I would give an update um, on the financial reporting for 31 December 2021. I often get a lot of queries around if you're preparing special purpose frameworks for not-for-profits. I guess there's been a lot of attention and a lot of guidance and alerts being put out because in the for-profit world, the special purpose framework has been abolished. In regards to the not-for-profit framework, depending on the type of your financial report, I've just put it in a table to, to make it a little bit more simplified for you to understand. But basically, if you're preparing general purpose financial statements, for 31 December 21 period, you do nothing. There's no impact. You continue carrying on disclosing as a general purpose financial statement set of accounts. If you're preparing um, general purpose RDR, 
You can, if you like, early adopt um, to the simplified disclosure standard. This would be an early adoption with mandatory adoption for the December 22 period. The adoption is obviously um, optional, and, but you don't have to restate your comparatives. Having gone through this for the June 21 cycle and um, many of my clients transitioning to the simplified disclosure standard for that reporting period, it's really not an onerous task going from RDR to SDS. There's a little bit of additional disclosures. There's a few wins in terms of taking things out, but by and large, it's relatively easy to do. And so it would just be whether you can have the time and resources to sort of go through that task at December 21. There's not, in my view, an additional value in early adopting because you don't have to restate comparatives because the additional disclosures are relatively simple. But if you are a special purpose financial statement um, preparer for 31 December 21, you do nothing. There are no changes at this stage to the special purpose framework for the not-for-profit sector. In terms of an update on that, so the AASB is still in the process and has been doing and has been in this process for quite some time, but they are developing a fit for purpose differential reporting framework for the not-for-profit sector with the aim of replacing the current framework, which they do anticipate will impact the ability for not-for-profits to prepare special purpose financial statements. It is a priority project. I did, um, I guess, just before you know, this presentation, um, reach out to the AASB just to get a, a more current update. Uh, and they are hoping that there will be a discussion paper issued for public comment at the end of it during the quarter three 2022 on this exact topic. In my reach out to the AASB, I did also talk about anything else that would be of interest um, to those attendees of the webinar. And I guess the topic of peppercorn leases did come up. So to refresh your memory, peppercorn leases are leases where the lease payments do not reflect the fair value of the property being leased. In other words, the consideration paid by the leasee is significantly less than the fair value, a very common occurrence in the not-for-profit world. The AASB this week have put a staff recommendation to the board to consider that for the not-for-profit private sector, that this um, accounting policy choice of um, measuring your peppercorn leases at cost or fair value be permanently put in place. And for those in the not-for-profit public sector, that it continue to be in place until such time as there's been additional guidance on the measurement of fair value of concessionary leases, which the um, board is also looking at. The final slide that I have for today is just around the bed licences. Now, whilst this is not just relevant for the not-for-profit sector, it has... Um, hit a number of my not-for-profit clients and I have been, um, I guess, across the issue. So we thought we would provide you with an update. Um, so aged care providers, both in the for-profit and not-for-profit space, will need to review the carrying amount of their bed licences in light of the announcement by the federal government that they will be dis discontinuing bed licences for the aged care sector from 1 July 2024. So depending on how you account for bed licences, you will need to consider how you're going to remove the bed licences from your balance sheet. If you're currently amortising those, you might need to think about whether you change the amortisation period and accelerate that amortisation such that there's no value left by the time 1 July 2024 comes around. If you're carrying them at cost or an infinite life, you do need to consider impairment given that there is now not an active market for those um, bed licences from 1 July 2024. And presumably between now and 24, there's going to be limited activity of people actually paying market dollar value that, that probably once existed if the licence um, regulation is no longer required. ASIC have put out an FAQ, which um, I would encourage you if you are a December reporter to have a look at. I guess it's just making you clear that there is this announcement, they're aware of it. So they're expecting to see an impact to your bed licenses carrying value and something you should um, refer to if you do have bed licenses. That's all from me and I'll hand over back to Renee for the international developments. Great, thanks Hayley. Um, so just a couple of quick things to go through in terms of some international developments. 
First of all, configuration or customization costs in a cloud computing arrangement, quite a, a mouthful. So if we has um, formed a decision in March 2022, on how to account for these. Now, just as a reminder, IFRIC is Interpretations Committee of the International Accounting Standards Board. And when they make a, a decision on an item where the accounting standard um, might be unclear or not specifically addressing what people in practice are experiencing, then the decision really does need to be implemented um, by financial reporters. And so that decision is effective immediately. The reason why it was on the agenda is because there was diversity in practice. Some companies were capitalizing this and some were expensing it. And following this uh, decision, we'd expect a lot of these costs that were previously capitalized to be written off, which could also include a, a prior period error or um, restatement. And so what this really um, gets to is for a SaaS arrangement, which is software as a service, a company might have a right to access software and use it for their own purposes. Um, and because a lot of companies often would go through, would incur quite a lot of um, expenses and go through quite a significant process of configuring it and implementing it, a lot of companies have considered that kind of cost that was incurred up front and might relate to a three or a five year license period to be capitalized and then amortized. However, what Ifrik is saying is that um, your first step needs to be to determine which, if any of the costs, meets the definition of an intangible asset before you capitalize it. So for it to be an intangible asset, it needs to be separable and transferable. So can you um, sell or transfer any part of that asset? Do you control it? And will the entity um, get economic benefits from its use? Now, economic benefits is quite easy to demonstrate if you have software as a service arrangement the company will probably um, have some economic benefits from using it, but it's quite difficult to illustrate control and transferability of um, a software as a service um, arrangement where you don't actually necessarily control that. So what we are seeing in practice is some companies are finding, or a lot of companies are finding part of it might be actually an intangible asset and part of it might be expense all of it expensed, but you need to take a critical lens to your um, capitalized costs on any kind of software as a service arrangement, basically. Um, the other thing to just bring to your attention is the International Sustainability Standards Board. So this is a brand new board that was just formed. Um, and the purpose will be to develop sustainability disclosure standards to meet investors' information needs. We're expecting some prototype climate and general disclosure requirements to be developed by um, the technical readiness working group over the coming months and so on, but we don't have any timeline yet. We don't really know what it's going to look like, when it's going to be applicable, how it's going to, you know, who's going to impact and so on. At the moment, they're just going through a process of consolidating the resources that they do have in this space and appointing board members. And then we're expecting to see quite a lot come out of this. So this is definitely a watch and see kind of area um, for people to, to keep tracking. Now, I am mindful that we are nearly out of time. I am just going to answer one brief question because we have received quite a few questions on the director identification number um, scheme. And so um, the question, the first question we received was, does it apply only to um, Australian resident directors or is it also applicable to overseas directors? And the simple answer to that is, um, yes, it applies to all directors, whether they're Australian resident or overseas directors. Um, it might be a little bit more complicated for an overseas director to apply for it, uh, might need a paper lodgement, but they are required to um, apply as well. And the other question is just around who the owners is on to um, apply, is it the director or the company? And really it's the director should be applying for their own um, identification number and then informing the company secretary and, and who will also should be chasing them up as well in order to keep um, a proper record of these things. And so it looks like uh, with that, it looks like we're out of time. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. We'd love to hear from you. So if you have any questions, please speak to your SW advisor or send through your queries to any of the speakers on the screen. Don't forget that we will send you the slides after the session. So I look forward to that. We'd also value your feedback on the webinar. So please complete our feedback survey, which will pop up on your screen at the conclusion of the webinar. 
This is the final session of our 21, 2021 financial reporting webinar series. What a year. Thank you for your support throughout the year. Be well, stay healthy, and we look forward to seeing you again for our 2022 series.